Hello, Middle Earthers. Welcome once again to another installment of The Silmarillion with your host, Stephen. It's the 14th of July. It just was pouring with rain just as quickly as, as it ended. But uh, it's enough to, to um, trick the tree frogs into thinking it's nighttime, and so they're out cheeping away, looking for dates. That's why uh, you hear that funny noise in the background. So we're on to chapter 17 already of the coming of men into the West. So the elves are going to experience new chaps roaming around. So, all right, let us get started. When 300 years and more were gone since the Noldor came to Beleriand in the days of the long peace, Finrod Felagund, Lord of Nargothrond, journeyed east of Sirion and went hunting with Maglor and Madros, sons of Feanor. But he wearied of the chase and passed on alone towards the mountains of Eredlindon that he saw shining afar. And taking the dwarf road, he crossed Galion at the ford of Sarn Athrad, and turning south over the upper streams of Askar, he came into the north of Osiriand. In a valley among the foothills of the mountains below the springs of Talos, he saw lights in the evening, and far off he heard the sound of song. At this he wondered much, for the green elves of that land lit no fires, nor did they sing by night. At first he feared that a raid of orcs had passed the leaguer of the north, but as he drew near he perceived that it was not so, for the singers used a tongue that he had not heard before, neither that of dwarves nor of orcs. Then. Felagund, standing silent in the night shadow of the trees, looked down into the camp, and there he beheld a strange people. Now these were a part of the kindred and following of Beor the Old, as he was afterwards called, a chieftain among men. After many lives of wandering out of the east, he had led them at last over the Blue Mountains, the first of the race of men to enter Beleriand. And they sang because they were glad, and believed that they had escaped from all perils and had come at last to a land without fear. Long, Felagund watched them, and love for them stirred in his heart, but he remained hidden in the trees until they had all fallen asleep. Then he went among the sleeping people and sat beside their dying fire where none kept watch. And he took up a rude harp which Beor had laid aside and he played music upon it, such as the ears of men had not heard, for they had as yet no teachers in the art, save only the dark elves in the wild lands. Now men awoke and listened to Felagund as he harped and sang, and each thought that he was in some fair dream, until he saw that his fellows were awake also beside him. But they did not speak or stir while Felagund still played, because of the beauty of the music and the wonder of the song. Wisdom was in the words of the elven king, and the hearts grew wiser that hearkened to him, for the things of which he sang, of the making of Arda and the bliss of Amen beyond the shadows of the sea, came as clear visions before their eyes, and his elvish speech was interpreted in each mind according to its measure. You can see there's Felagund there, playing the harp. Luckily, there's no suspicious one who will draw an arrow on him. Thus it was that men called King Felagund, whom they first met of all the Eldar, Gnome, that is, wisdom in the language of that people, and after him they named his folk Gnomin, the wise. Indeed, they believed at first that Felagund was one of the Valar, of whom they had heard rumor that they dwelt far in the west. And this was, some say, the cause of their journeying. But Felagund dwelt among them and taught them true knowledge, and they loved him and took him for their lord, and were ever after loyal to the house of Finarfin. Now the Eldar were beyond all other peoples skilled in tongues, and Felagund discovered also that he could read in the minds of men such thoughts as they wished to reveal in speech, so that their words were easily interpreted. It is said also that these men had long had dealings with the dark elves east of the mountains, and from them had learned much of their speech. And since all the languages of the Quendai were of one origin, the language of Beor and his folk resembled the elven tongue in many words and devices. 
It was not long, therefore, before Felagund could hold converse with Beor, and while he dwelt with him they spoke much together. But when he questioned him concerning the arising of men and their journeys, Beor would say little, and indeed he knew little, for the fathers of his people had told few tales of their past, and a silence had fallen upon their memory. A darkness lies behind us, Beor said, and we have turned our backs upon it, and we do not desire to return thither even in thought. Westwards our hearts have been turned, and we believe that there we shall find light. But it was said afterwards among the Eldar that when men awoke in Hildorian at the rising of the sun, the spies of Morgoth were watchful, and tidings were soon brought to him. And this seemed to him so great a matter that secretly under shadow he himself departed from Angban and went forth into Middle Earth, leaving to Sauron the command of the war. Of his dealings with men, the Eldar indeed knew nothing at that time and learnt but little afterwards, but that a darkness lay upon the hearts of men as the shadow of the kinslaying and the doom of Mandos lay upon the Noldor. They perceived clearly, even in the people of the elf friends whom they first knew, to corrupt or destroy whatsoever arose new and fair was ever the chief desire of Morgoth, and doubtless he had this purpose also in his errand, by fear and lies to make men the foes of the Eldar and bring them up out of the east against Beleriand. But this design was slow to ripen and was never wholly achieved, for men, it is said, were at first very few in number, whereas Morgoth grew afraid of the growing power and union of the Eldar and came back to Angband, leaving behind at that time but few servants, and those of less might and cunning. Now Felagund learned from Beor that there were many other men of like mind who were also journeying westward. Others of my own kin have crossed the mountains, he said, and they are wandering not far away, and the Haladin, a people from whom we are sundered in speech, are still in the valleys on the eastern slopes awaiting tidings before they venture further. There are yet other men whose tongues is more like to ours, with whom we have had dealings at times. They were before us on the westward march, but we passed them, for they are a number, for they are a numerous people, and yet keep together and move slowly, being all ruled by one chieftain whom they call Marak. Now the green elves of Osiriand were troubled by the coming of men, and when they heard that a lord of the Eldar from over the sea was among them, they sent messengers to Felagund. Lord, they said, if you have power over these newcomers, bid them return by the ways that they came, or else to go forward. For we desire no strangers in this land to break the peace in which we live. And these folk are hewers of trees and hunters of beasts. Therefore we are their unfriends, and if they will not depart, we shall afflict them in all ways that we can. Then, by the advice of Felagund, Beor gathered all the wandering families and kindreds of his people, and they removed over Galion and took up their abode in the lands of Amrod and Amraz, upon the east banks of the Salon River of Nan Elmoth, near to the borders of Doriath. And the name of that land thereafter was Estelad, the encampment. But when after a year had passed, Felagund wished to return to his own country, Beor begged leave to come with him, and he remained in the service of the king of Nargothrond while his life lasted. In this way he got his name, Beor, whereas his name before had been Balan, for Beor signified vassal in the tongue of his people. The rule of his folk he committed to Baron, his elder son, and he did not return again to Estelad. Soon after the departure of Felagund, the other men of whom Beor had spoken came also into Beleriand. First came the Haladin, but meeting the unfriendship of the green elves, they returned north and dwelt in Thargelion, in the country of Caranthir, son of Feanor. There for a time they had peace, and the people of Caranthir paid little heed to them. In the next year Marak led his people over the mountains. They were a tall and warlike folk, marching in ordered companies, and the elves of Osiriand hid themselves and did not waylay them. But Marek, hearing that the people of Beor were dwelling in a green and fertile land, came down the dwarf road and settled in the country south and east 
of the dwellings of Baran, son of Beor. And there was great friendship between those peoples. Felagund himself often returned to visit men, and many other elves out of the west lands, both Noldor and Sindar, journeyed to Estelad, being eager to see the Edain, whose coming had long been foretold. Now Atani, the second people, was the name given to men in Valinor, in the lore, and told of their coming. But in the speech of Beleriand, that name became Edain, and it was there used only of the three kindreds of the elf friends. Fingolfin, as king of all the Noldor, sent messengers of welcome to them, and then many young and eager men of the Edain went away and took service with the kings and lords of the Eldar. Among them was Malak, son of Marak, and he dwelt in Hithlam for fourteen years, and he learned the elven tongue and was given the name of Aradan. The Adain did not long dwell content in Estelad, for many still desired to go westward, but they did not know the way. Before them lay the fences of Doriath, and southward lay Sarayan and its impassable fens. Therefore the kings of the three houses of the Noldor, seeing hope of strength in the sons of men, sent word that any of the Adain that wished might remove and come to dwell among their people. In this way the migration of the Adain began, at first little by little, but later in families and kindreds they arose and left Estelad, until after some fifty years many thousands had entered the lands of the kings. Most of these took the long road northwards until the ways became well known to them. The people of Beor came to Dorthonian, Dorthonian and dwelt in lands ruled by the house of Finarfin. The people of Aradan, for Marak his father remained in Estelad until his death, for the most part went on westward, and some came to Hithlum, but Magor, son of Aradan, and many of the people passed down Sarayan into Beleriand, and dwelt a while in the vales of the southern slopes of Eridwedrin. It is said that in all these matters none save Finrod Felagund took counsel with King Tingol, and he was well pleased, both for that reason and because he was troubled by dreams concerning the coming of men, ere ever the first tidings of them were heard. Therefore he commanded that men should take no lands to dwell in save in the north, and that the princes whom they served should be answerable for all that they did. And he said, Into Doriath shall no man come while my realm lasts, not even in those of the house of Beor who serve Finrod the Beloved. Melian said nothing, no, it's Melian, Melian said nothing to him at that time, but afterwards she said to Galadriel, now the world runs on swiftly to great tidings, and one of men, even of Beor's house, shall indeed come, and the girdle of Melian shall not restrain him, for doom greater than my power shall send him, and the songs that shall spring from that coming shall endure when all Middle Earth is changed. But many men remained in Estelad, and there was still a mingled people living there long years after, until in the ruin of Beleriand they were overwhelmed or fled back into the east. For beside the old who deemed that their wandering days were over, there were not a few who desired to go their own ways, and they feared the Eldar and the light of their eyes. And then dissensions awoke among the Adain, in which the shadow of Morgoth may be discerned. For certain it is that he knew of the coming of men into Beleriand, and of their growing friendship with the elves. The leaders of discontent were Bereg of the house of Beor, and Amlak, one of the grandsons of Marak, and they said openly, We took long roads desiring to escape the perils of Middle-earth and the dark things that dwell there, for we heard that there was light in the west, but now we learn that the light is beyond the sea. Thither we cannot come where the gods dwell in bliss, save one. For the Lord of the Dark is here before us, and the Eldar, wise but fell, who make endless war upon him. In the north he dwells, they say, and there is the pain and death from which we fled. We will not go that way. Then a council and assembly of men was called, and great numbers came together. And the elf lords answered Bereg, saying, Truly from the Dark King come all the evils from which we fled, but he seeks dominion over all Middle-earth, and whither now shall we return, and he will not pursue us, unless he be vanquished here, or at least held in leaguer. Only by the valor of the Eldar is he restrained, and maybe it was for this purpose, to aid them at need, 
that we were brought into this land. To this, Beric answered, let the Eldar look to it. Our lives are short enough. But there arose one who seemed to all to be Amlak, son of Imlak, speaking fell words that shook the hearts of all who heard him. All this is but elvish lore, tales to beguile newcomers that are unwary. The sea has no shore. There is no light in the west. You have followed a fool fire of the elves to the end of the world. Which of you has seen the least of the gods? Who has beheld the dark king of the north? Those who seek the dominion of Middle-earth are the Eldar. Greedy for wealth, they have delved in the earth for its secrets and have stirred to wrath the things that dwell beneath it, as they have ever done and ever shall. Let the orcs have the realm that is theirs, and we will have ours. There is room in the world if the Eldar will let us be. Then those that listened sat for a while astounded, and a shadow of fear fell on their hearts, and they resolved to depart far from the lands of the Eldar. But afterwards Amlak returned among them and denied that he had been present at their debate or had spoken such words as they reported, and there was doubt and bewilderment among men. Then the Elf Lord said, You will now believe this at least. There is indeed a dark lord, and his spies and emissaries are among us, for he fears us and the strength that we may give to his foes. But some still answered, He hates us, rather, and ever the more the longer we dwell here, meddling in his quarrel with the kings of the Eldar to no gain of ours. Many, therefore, of those that yet remained in Estelad made ready to depart, and Bereg led a thousand of the people of Baor away southwards, and they passed out of the songs of those days. But Amlak repented, saying, I have now a quarrel of my own with this master of lies, which will last to my life's end. And he went away north and entered the service of Madras. But those of his people, who were of like mind with Bereg, chose a new leader, and they went back over the mountains into Eriador and are forgotten. During this time, the Haladin remained in Targelion and were content. But Morgoth, seeing that by lies and deceits he could not yet wholly estrange elves and men, was filled with wrath and endeavoured to do men hurt, what hurt he could. Therefore he sent out an orc raid, and passing east it escaped the leaguer, and came in stealth back over Ered Lindon by the passes of the dwarf road, and fell upon the Haladin in the southern woods of the land of Caranthir. Now the Haladin did not live under the rules of lords or many together, but each homestead was set apart and governed its own affairs, and they were slow to unite. But there was among them a man named Hal Hal Haldad, who was masterful and fearless, and he gathered all the brave men that he could find and retreated to the angle of land between Asgar and Goliath, and in the utmost corner he built a stockade across from water to water, and behind it they led all the women and children that they could save. There they were besieged until their food was gone. Haldad had twin children, Haleth his daughter and Haldar his son, and both were valiant in the defense, for Haleth was a woman of great heart and strength. But at last Haldad was slain in a sortie against the orcs, and Haldar, who rushed out to save his father's body from their butchery, was hewn down beside him. Then Haleth led the people, held the people together, though they were without hope, and some cast themselves in the rivers and were drowned. But seven days later, as the orcs made their last assault and had already broken through the stockade, there came suddenly a music of trumpets, and Caranthir, with his host, came down from the north and drove the orcs into the rivers. Then Caranthir looked kindly upon men and did Haleth great honor and he offered her recompense for her father and brother. And seeing over late what valor there was in the Adain, he said to her, If you will remove and dwell further north, there you shall have the friendship and protection of the Eldar and free lands of your own. But Haleth was proud and unwilling to be guided or ruled, and most of the Haladin were of like mood. Therefore she thanked Caranthir, but answered, my mind is now set, Lord, to leave the shadow of the mountains and go west, whither others of our kin have gone. When therefore the Haladin 
had gathered all whom they could find alive of their folk who had fled wild into the woods before the orcs, and had gleaned what remained of their goods in their burned homesteads. They took Halef for their chief, and she led them at last to Estelad, and there dwelt for a time. But they remained a people apart, and were ever after known to elves and men as the people of Haleth. Haleth remained their chief while her days lasted, but she did not wed, and the headship afterwards passed to Haldan, son of Haldar, her brother. Soon, however, Haleth desired to move westward again, and though most of her people were against this counsel, she led them forth once more, and they went without help or guidance of the Eldar, and passing over Ceylon and Aros, they, they journeyed in the perilous land between the mountains of Terror and the girdle of Milion. That land was even then not yet so evil as it after became, but it was no road for mortal men to take without aid, and Haleth only brought her people through it with hardship and loss, constraining them to go forward by the strength of her will. At last they crossed over the Brithiac, and many bitterly repented of their journey, but there was now no returning. Therefore, in new lands, they went back to their old life as best they could, and they dwelt in free homesteads in the woods of Taleth Durnan, beyond Taglin, and some wandered far into the realm of Nargothrond. But there were many who loved the Lady Haleth and wished to go whither she would, and dwell under her rule, and these she led into the forest of Brethil between Taglin and Sarion. Thither, in the evil days that followed, many of her scattered folk returned. Now Brethil was claimed as part of his realm by King Tingle, though it was not within the girdle of Melian, Melian, and he would have denied it to Haleth. But Felagund, who had the friendship of Tingle, hearing of all that had befallen the people of Haleth, obtained this grace for her, that she should dwell free in Brethil, upon the condition only that her people should guard the crossings of Taglin against all enemies of the Eldar, and allow no orcs to enter their woods. To this Haleth answered, where are Haldad, my father, and Haldar, my brother? If the king of Doriath fears a friendship between Haleth and those who have devoured her kin, then the thoughts of the Eldar are strange to men. And Haleth dwelt in Brethel until she died, and her people raised a green mound over her in the heights of the forest, Tur Haritha, the Lady Barrow, Haud and Arwen in the Sandaran tongue. In this way it came to pass that the Adain dwelt in the lands of the Eldar, some here, some there, some wandering, some settled and kindreds or small peoples, and the most part of them soon learned the grey elven tongue, both as a common speech among themselves and because many were eager to learn the lore of the elves. But after a time the elf kings, seeing that it was not good for elves and men to dwell mingled together without order, and that men needed lords of their own kind, set regions apart where men could live their own lives and appointed chieftains to hold these lands freely. They were the allies of the Eldar in war, but marched under their own leaders. Yet many of the Adain had delight in the friendship of the elves and dwelt among them for so long as they had leave, and the young men often took service for a time in the hosts of the kings. Now Hador, Lorendol, son of Hathel, son of Magor, son of Malach Aradan, entered the household of Fingolfin in his youth, and was loved by the king. Fingolfin therefore gave to him the lordship of Dorlomen, and into that land he gathered most of the people of his kin, and became the mightiest of the chieftains of the Adain. In his house only the elven tongue was spoken, but their own speech was not forgotten, and from it came the common tongue of Numenor. But in Dorthunion the lordship of the people of Beor and the country of Ladros was given to Boromir, son of Boron, who was the grandson of Beor the Old. The sons of Hador were Galdor and Gundor, and the sons of Galdor were Huron and Huor, and the son of Huron was Turin, the bane of Glaurung, and the son of Huor was Chuor, father of Erendil the Blessed. The son of Boromir was Bregor, whose sons were Bregolas and Barahir, and the sons of Bregolas were Baragund and Belagund, the daughter of Baragund was Morwen, the mother of Turin, and the daughter of Belagund was Rianne, the mother of Tuor. But the son of Barahir was Beren One Hand, who won the love of Luthien Tingle's daughter and returned from the dead. From them came Elwing, the wife of Erendil, and all the kings of Numenor after. 
All these were caught in the net of the doom of the Noldor, and they did great deeds which the Eldar remember still among the histories of the kings of old. And in those days the strength of men was added to the power of the Noldor, and their hope was high, that Morgoth was straitly enclosed for the people of Hador, being hardy to endure cold and long wandering, feared not at times to go far into the north and there keep watch upon the movements of the enemy. The men of the three houses throve and multiplied, but greatest among them was the house of Hador Goldenhead, peer of elven lords. His people were of great strength and stature, ready in mind, bold and steadfast, quick to anger and to laughter, mighty among the children of Iluvatar and the youth of mankind. Yellow-haired they were for the most part, and blue-eyed, but not so was Turin, whose mother was Mordwin of the house of Beor. The men of that house were dark or brown of hair with grey eyes, and of all men they were most like to the Noldor and most loved by them, for they were eager of mind, cunning-handed, swift in understanding, long in memory, and they were moved sooner to pity than to laughter. Like to them were the woodland folk of Haleth, but they were of lesser stature and less eager for lore. They used few words and did not love great concourse of men, and many among them delighted in solitude, wandering free in the green woods, while the wonder of the lands of the Eldar was new upon them. But in the realms of the west their time was brief and their days unhappy. The years of the Adain were lengthened according to the reckoning of men after their coming to Beleriand, but at last Beor the Old died when he had lived three and ninety years, for four and forty of which he had served King Felagund. And when he lay dead of no wound or grief but stricken by age, the Eldar saw for the first time the swift waning of the life of men and the death of weariness which they knew not of themselves, and they grieved greatly for the loss of their friends. But Beor at the last had relinquished his life willingly and passed in peace. And the Eldar wondered much at the strange fate of men, for in all their lore there was no account of it, and its end was hidden from them. Nonetheless, the Adain of old learned swiftly of the Eldar all such art and knowledge as they could receive, and their sons increased in wisdom and skill, until they far surpassed all others of mankind who dwelt still east of the mountains and had not seen the Eldar, nor looked upon the faces that had beheld the light of Valinor. Yeah. The rain has started again. I love rain reading when it's raining out. Fare thee well, my friends, and peace be with you. Until next time.